We're going to move to a panel about what the uh, the state of uh, the U.S. American hostage recovery. Uh, what is the what is the state of the America of America's hostage recovery enterprise? Uh, that panel is going to be moderated by Sarah Levinson Moriarty, who's a fellow here at New America, and who was instrumental in getting the Levinson Act passed, which has uh, made it much easier for the U.S. government to pursue wrongfully detained cases. Um, and Sarah Levinson's dad uh, was um, held by the Iranians for 12 years and died in captivity. The act is named after him. Um, so I'm going to say if Sarah could come to the stage, she will then introduce the panel. I'm going to bring the energy. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with people that I consider friends. Um, so let me introduce the members of the panel. So I have Colonel Chris Costa, who's executive director of the International Spy Museum. He's also the former special assistant to the president and senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council. Then we have truly one of the strongest women I have ever met in my life, Caitlin Coleman, who was held hostage by the Taliban for five years. And uh, Ambassador Roger Carstens, who is amazing as the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. And since the implementation of the Levinson Act, um, we have been able to recover at least 70 individuals from some sort of captivity. And Roger has been the force to be reckoned with in making that happen, or one of the forces to be reckoned with. He always shares the credit. Um, so in, in the work that I've been doing at New America, I keep circling around this thought of there's really five pillars of hostage issues, hostage policy, call it what you will, along this continuum. Um, and the five pillars are awareness, return, support, deterrence, and justice. So anything that we are doing in the hostage space generally falls within one of those five pillars. And I think thanks to people on this panel today, we've been able to accomplish so much in a lot of those pillars. Um, one place that um, we have especially had a lot of success is return, as we said. Um, especially congratulations on the recent return of the individuals from Russia in that historic prisoner exchange. Um, I think the question that comes to a lot of people's mind is we have been able to get several individuals home from a lot of these bad actor countries. And I've had some great conversations, Roger, with your deterrence team. Um, and I think we're all very interested to see what comes next after these returns. How do we deter these countries from doing this? So I'm curious your thoughts, especially in your conversations and how you lead your team in that space. Yeah, sure, uh, I'll do that. But first I wanna say thank you for hosting and uh, moderating this panel. Uh, I'd like to also say thanks to New America Foundation and for Arizona State University for bringing us all together to talk about this topic. I'd also like to point out that, I, I, as you can tell, I'm nervous when I speak publicly. And so I've tried to populate the audience with five or six of my very close friends. I'm gonna call Doug Olivant and Chuck McLaughlin out there right there. So I've given them some softball questions of which to pose me <laughs> later. So I wanna say, you know, we're good like that. But in this one, the, the deterrence thing is, is supremely important. If you're going to make these hard deals, you've got to give people the thought that it's gonna end one day that if we can one day make it so hard for countries, nation states, to take our citizens, that they won't do it. You know, you've raised the cost too much. And that's something that uh, Secretary Blinken and the President in his June 22 uh, executive order have tasked uh, us, our office, to lead. Now I say lead, it's, it's kind of like in a way a false way of, of proclaiming what's happening. We're working throughout the interagency to come up with different tools. If the United States usually sanctions people, why aren't we exploring things that could be used in other diplomatic means, the information space, the military space, economic, financial, legal? There are other tools that have never put, been put into the service of deterring nation states from taking our citizens. But also, it's more important that since this is a global issue, we need to take a global look at this and come up with a solution globally. And to that, uh, uh, to that end, we've had a chance to meet uh, twice with uh, a, a slew of countries um, to talk about how we can work together to raise those prices. So instead of the United States uh, having to go one-on-one -on -one bilaterally with a hostage-taking country, I'll just say Iran as an example, uh, we'd like to get other countries to uh, band with us to start raising that cost. But same thing, if it's a Belgian citizen who's taken by the Iranians, the United States wants to also be there. So we can come up with different ways that all these different countries can leverage um, uh, the Iranians to bring th that citizen back. Uh, the other thing I'd say is we're working on prevention strategies too. 
Uh, we, we've met with lots of businesses to try to get them to uh, make their employees aware of the threat. Uh, there's a travel advisory. Uh, there's the D indicator put out by consular affairs warning people not to go to certain nation states. So between, uh, I would say, prevention and deterrence, you know, I think we, we, the train has less, left the station. It's not at 100 miles an hour yet, but it's probably at 30. And if we do this right, if we can work with other countries, if we can work with uh, maybe capitalize on the good work that the Canadians did in their declaration against arbitrary detention and state-to-state -state relations, signed right now by 78 countries and the EU, yeah, then I think we can get there. It may take many years, but I, I can see a day when I get to dismantle a good chunk of my office because we're no longer dealing with the issue of nation states. And Kara, thanks for doing all that work. She's the one that, that uh, worked for in our office before she uh, transferred over to Capitol Hill uh, on the deterrence team. So, but again, hey, thanks for that question. And again, thanks for, uh, for having us here today. Yeah, and I think Capitol Hill has a lot of things planned around deterrence to support yeah. you in this. So really looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. Um, I like to start with the tough questions that are at the top of everybody's mind and then work my way back. So I'm going to start with the other piece that's on the top of everybody's mind is what's happening in Gaza right now. And Chris, I wanted to ask you a bit from your experience, you know, the one year anniversary of October 7th is coming up quick. You've talked about the importance of negotiating and working with international partners. So I'm wondering what we can learn from your perspective on that and past conversations you might have had in that space. Sarah, I appreciate the question, and also I'd like to thank New America and also Arizona State University. And being up here on the stage with my friends is an extraordinary experience, so this is a bit of a gift to be able to share some perspectives, so thank you. Um, that said, a year ago, Roger and I and a group of people, me outside the government, if you can imagine, participated and role-played my previous job along with Roger and the Cutteries. And we walked through an exercise scenario where we had hostages, unknowing that October 7th would happen in the ensuing months. And we walked through that exercise, and what we learned is the Cutteries had a disposition, an interest in mediating, and an aptitude for it. And we learned a lot about the Cutteries and they shared their perspectives, we shared our perspectives, and we realized typically we wanted to do the rescue, they wanted to negotiate, and there was a natural tension that we couldn't have planned for that we worked through, but we got to know how each other worked. And then October 7th happened, and within days I had an opportunity, again, outside the government, to share that perspective, I think, on Smirkanish, on CNN, and I offered that I had confidence that the Israeli government would have to conduct military operations. There'll be a tension between in driving intelligence and trying to rescue their citizens, and at the same time, there would be an interest in negotiating, and the Qataris had played that role. And I think it's really important to understand that that is an important tool in the toolbox, uh, so to speak. And really, Roger, Roger leads the diplomacy efforts along with other State Department and, and other envoys from different countries, and I think it's really important to always factor in diplomacy along with the other tools that we have. So I think that was illuminating to me, and also just to digress for a second to say, it says a lot also about Roger's office that they allowed him to go with all that he had go, going on. Roger participated as an ambassador in a role-playing exercise and how valuable that turned out to be. Um, so thank you for that. That's interesting. Anything, any thoughts that you wanted to share bit, to build on that or? No, I have to, I have to say um, uh, thanks to the leadership that was shown by uh, the Sufan group and others. You know, it's, uh, we all often say that this is a team sport. If you're waiting for the U.S. government to always get it right and take the lead, sometimes you're going to be waiting too long. There are examples of New America Foundation, Peter, providing some leadership. But it was not necessarily a government solution, or, that, that, or rather that got us all together. It was an organization with outside government. And uh, I think that's a very powerful way of looking at this. Um, there are times when empowered individuals, senators, congressmen, the media, members of the NGO community will find their... Uh, their, their uh, feet and, and provide leadership in these uh, situations. So I think Chris not only gives us a chance to see what an exercise could look like that actually paid off after October 7th, but also uh, kind of highlights the value of those outside of government getting into this, this uh, effort. Thank you. So Caitlin, you actually have a different perspective because you were a hostage 
what can we learn from your experience that we should be thinking about? People are still traveling to Afghanistan aside from the, um, the panel that we listened to earlier, which is right travel. I think we have American tourists who are still trying to go. We've, I've seen Instagram posts about people traveling to Afghanistan and articles about it. What can we learn from your experience about how people view Americans? Um, and what else can we take from your own experience? Um, yeah, thank you. So, and also thank you to New America and Arizona State University for, for making this happen. Uh, very appreciative. And um, from my perspective, what, what I and other travelers in that region, in Central Asia, who had an interest in Afghanistan, I think weren't aware of. I mean, everybody knew Afghanistan was a conflict zone. And so those who were going there went with that knowledge. But as far as um, being taken hostage, like that was not a scenario that had ever occurred to me that I had any understanding of. And I, I don't think the others in that region, travelers in that region did either. So I think more education uh, for travelers, I, I, you know, Americans have a right to travel all over the world, but making them aware of the specific risks that are associated, not just, it's a conflict zone. What does that mean? You know, a lot of times it doesn't go beyond just, it's a conflict zone without an understanding of exactly what could happen. It's not just stay out of conflict areas, stay out of battles. It's also that people in that in in those regions people like the Taliban in Afghanistan and other terrorist organizations or extremist or extremists have this concept of Americans as first a very very valuable asset so in very short time that an american may travel to one of those regions these people first of all as an american you stick out as a sore thumb like a sore thumb and very quickly, plans are put together by these sort of operators that, um, that result in a hostage taking. And for, sometimes for years, sometimes the hostage doesn't survive. Sometimes the hostage is held hostage for years and there's so much trauma that people going into these regions don't know and, and you had said, we had talked about this a little bit recently, that the way that they view Americans and what our connections are and where we come from and our connections to wealth. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, so my, my interactions with the, with the Taliban and Haqqani when I was held hostage, there was, the, and, and even others in the region that were not affiliated, but there's this concept of Americans as if you're um, American, you are wealthy, you have connections to wealthy people. You know, even though I didn't ha I did not have these sorts of connections, and a lot of people who travel there have no resources, and they're not traveling with any organizations. But there's this idea that if you're an American in Afghanistan, you must have, you must be a millionaire, and you are connected to the CIA. You know, and, and that applies to anyone in that region, NGOs who go in, the Red Cross who goes in to try and help these people. There's a tremendous amount of paranoia amongst the Taliban and the Haqqani. Again, you know, that if, if you're coming from the West, you're coming, at, you know, affiliated with the CIA, with, you know, intelligence agencies. And, and so they use their perception of the, of these people or even just travelers who are just coming to travel to justify taking them hostage you know that they can get a big payout plus their you know it, it's forwarding their concept of jihad thank you and I, I think there's a dangerous trend right now of this popularization of traveling to every country in the world and it, despite the risks you still need to go see Iran or whatever it might be. And I think one thing that we've really been trying to do from an awareness perspective is, is build that awareness. And one of the greatest things that happened in legislation at the end of last year was the codification of a hostage flag. 
that was created jointly by many families, both active um, hostages and former hostages and their families. Um, Roger, I'm curious from your perspective, what's the rece reception been to the introduction of that flag and how do people view it uh, from where you sit? What have you seen? Yeah, so first off, uh, got to thank you for the work that you did behind the scenes to get that legislation passed. And as you probably know, the flag, um, it has a, a lot of, uh, I would say, your father's thumbprint on it. Uh, the, the date that it was selected is, you know, obviously associated with your father and his, his taking by the Iranians. Uh, so I uh, appreciated that. And, and I have to tell you, the, uh, the reception has been incredible. I mean, you know, we've flown in on a, on a few occasions. We flew it on the day, of course, that the legislation passed on the 9th of March. We flew it shortly thereafter when another American passed away in captivity. Uh, they're, they're rendered that judgment that he passed away. Uh, we, we've flown it recently when uh, Hirsch Goldberg Poland was uh, declared deceased uh, just about two weeks ago. And we also had a chance to fly it when we have had our successes, like we brought the Americans and others back from Russia on the 1st of August. So the, the flag has actually provided, I would say, a very strong rallying point. And that's kind of a neat thing, I guess, when your, your nation is recognizing that um, someone's come back or you're, you're memorializing the passing of someone who's, who's held a hostage. And having a flag that's flown over the Department of Defense, Capitol Hill, the State Department, and the White House I mean, that, I think that's meaningful. And every time that happens, we have uh, probably hundreds of people from the State Department who are, have nothing to do with my office that will go outside and watch diplomatic security raise that flag up. So I think it's a tangible, uh, I guess, symbol. It's a symbol that this is important to this nation. It's definitely important to the, uh, the, the federal government. And we're grateful for all the work that um, I would say uh, bring our families home and others who've been touched by this did with our colleagues on Capitol Hill to get this passed. Thank you. And I'm hoping we see more of it. We yeah. see expansion of it and we see it at passport offices or at um, airports as we were talking about. Um, we've made so much progress in the hostage space since my dad was taken in 2007. Chris, you've been witness to it firsthand both inside and outside of government. What is some of the progress that you've seen and what, um, what implications has that had? Yeah, thanks for the question. The good news is we have made tremendous progress. Um, just go back in time, circa 2014, ISIS were taking Americans and Britons and others from across the world hostage and brutally killing them. And the United States really wasn't prepared to handle the crisis that we were dealing with and it was inept and that's not a political commentary. Our predecessors admitted it, understood it. The Obama administration made some changes, significant changes, and created a presidential policy director, directive, excuse me, which essentially recognized a failure to, to, to handle these situations, to listen to the voices of the families first and foremost, and then start aligning the U.S. government to focus on these difficult problems. So 2014, these, the enterprise was born because families pushed on the U.S. government. And to watch that through a historical lens has been extraordinary. And what I inherited in 2017 when I stepped into the White House, I had no Ambassador Carston. So I was already vulnerable, didn't know it, because I had the portfolio for for terrorists that were taking hostages because I was responsible with my team for counterterrorism and hostages that weren't acknowledged by the U.S. government to include Bob Levinson, former FBI agent, when a country doesn't acknowledge holding an American, or the Syrian government in the case of Austin Tice, and several other hostages that I can't acknowledge because we don't know who they are. The U.S. government does, but the public does not. For, for obvious reasons. So all of that said, that's what I inherited and we continue to work and refine the kind of, kind of uh, tools that we had and one of the successes that we had, and this is the first time I've been with Caitlin on stage to talk about the experience, but during that first year of the Trump administration, we were able to harness th this new engine, this new uh, enterprise, if you will, the hostage fusion cell, the State Department, the office that uh, Roger runs, along with the White House and all of the actors that we don't acknowledge in the intelligence community, and we were able to drive Pakistan and help uh, drive their recovery 
of Caitlin, the backstory I can't share, but the bottom line is the Pakistanis did the right thing and uh, Caitlin and her children came back to, to the West. All of that said, from that position, I've also had the opportunity to watch the changes made when we had an ambassador, Roger Carstens, and I should acknowledge also uh, Robert O'Brien who was the ambassador that came in shortly after I left the White House. And since then, we've seen the success on August 1st. We've seen the dialogue, the narrative change. There's an extraordinary uh, movement, if you will, a momentum to continue to build out this enterprise. So the last point I will make, that's come because there's been a partnership with, with the families, families first, uh, Roger and his team never fails to reach out to touch the families and hear their perspectives. At the same time, we continue to refine. I keep saying we, and I apologize for that because <laughs> it's the U.S. government. I'm on the outside watching this. It's imperfect because it is the U.S. government. It is imperfect, and we have work to do. And the last point I'll make, and then I'll stop here, is, you know, Roger has stick stuck his chest out metaphorically and said, hold me and my team accountable. Actually, he says, hold me accountable. And that's the ethos of people that are in this space. We need to be held accountable. The U.S. government needs to be held accountable by the families and the people. So I, I, to answer your question in a short burst, it's been extraordinary to watch. We need to continue to refine this. We continue need to grow the relationships with our foreign partners so they can replicate the success here. But I think we're on a good trajectory. Thanks, Chris. I think, um, so when I come back to the five pillars, another pillar that we're starting to see emerge a bit more um, is the justice pillar. So we saw the conviction of the ISIS Beatles last year. We recently saw indictments for Hamas. Um, what, what can we be thinking about from a justice perspective? And I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, I'm going to start with Caitlin, though. I'd love to hear your perspective, because I think justice means different things to different people. And I know we've had conversations about what might justice look like for you, for your experience, or for others. Um, yeah, so, I mean, for me, justice and peace that I could draw from closure and peace that I could draw from my experience would look like continued pursuit of those who held us hostage, those who abused us, those who abused my children. Um, you know, I recognize the difficulty in pursuing and indicting individuals that are living in that region of the world, um, but I, I think that justice, my feeling is that justice should not um, that politics and geopolitics should not impact justice. Nobody disputes that taking people hostage or wrongfully, illegally detaining them is criminal. And that should be the bottom line until the point that they are captured and, and held accountable. Roger, how about your perspective on that? Uh, I might leave uh, the you want to cover something about the FBI and their dogged pursuit of this, I'll, I'll take something else and say <laughs> that. Um, that one too. Yeah, I figured, oh, you know what? Of course you can. Yeah, I should have thrown that right back at you. Uh, I think in, uh, in terms of justice, uh, the one thing that we now have, thanks to the Bob Levinson Act passed in 2020 by uh, our colleagues on Capitol Hill, um, we now have a sanctioning authority in my office. So if uh, we identify someone like uh, for the IRGC, for example, which we sanctioned, the FSB, which we sanctioned, we are now able to impose uh, financial and travel restrictions on those who do kind of do this for a living. Uh, we, we try to be very smart about using it. We work with uh, the Department of Treasury in, in, in putting these out, but it now gives us a way to an extent of uh, providing a sense of justice, although it may not be the final measure that, that we're, we're all kind of hoping for and looking for one day. But I'll, I'll at least stop there and just say at least there's something right now that we can do that might make the bad guys a little more uncomfortable. But I will say, by the way, the, there are people out there in the world that if you, if you freeze their money, well, they, they don't use electronic banking systems. And so there, there are some things we still need to keep working on if we're going to reach out and touch these folks. Uh, I'll just answer a short, provide a short answer. The bottom line is I sat in 
on the Beatles trial to see justice play out in the courts. In the Beatles, of course, were the hostage cell that were responsible for killing Americans and Britons. And really, I had a different uh, um, perspective on justice. I saw what I construed as justice overseas, taking it to our adversaries, and frankly, by going into the courtroom, I saw a different form of justice, which I think uh, made the uh, families, it's hard to, you can't bring back uh, those who have been killed, but it certainly was um, calming for the families to be there and to know that there's a long arm of U.S. justice and ultimately this terrorist, this foreign person, found their way into a U.S. court in front of a U.S. jury, in front of a U.S. judge, and uh, I witnessed that, and I think that is a very important sense of justice that I appreciated by sitting in a courtroom. Yeah, I came from a lot of meetings today on Capitol Hill, and the thing that I keep coming back to is I want to see indictments for what happened to my father, and right. I think we need more of that, so hopefully we can see more of that. Um, I'm going to ask maybe one or two more questions, and then I'll open it up to you guys. But um, I wanted to ask Chris, you and I are part of the, CIA, um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, Hostage Commission, um, Commission on Hostage and right. Rightful Detention Taking. Uh, what's been your perspective on how that's going? What are we learning from that? And uh, what can we share today that might be something um, we should be considering? Just two quick points. What I've observed by having someone from a hostage family like Sarah, somebody who's been a hostage like Jason Rezaian, sitting on the commission, those perspectives are absolutely crucial. So imagine that. We're going to offer some policy prescriptions, and we have direct feedback from those that have been, been in captivity. Uh, so I think that is extremely important in this idea of deterrence, going back to um, what you have helped us understand, your perspectives, which drives the discussions for how do we raise cost to those individuals who are taking hostages overseas and wrongfully detaining Americans and partners and others taking away their liberty. How do we raise the cost and to the point where there's no more need for the office of SPIHA? Um, and I think we're going to see some work rolled out from CSIS on some ideas on, uh, yeah. on deterrence. Yeah, so I, I come back to that hostage taking is biblical. I think it was even in the New York Times opinion piece recently, and I wrote it in a research paper first. <laughs> but hostage taking is biblical. And I think it's a really great plan to try to eliminate the SPIHA office, but I think it's not. It's not a likely plan. So I think what we need to do is create a stigma behind it and, and amplify efforts for deterrence so that it becomes harder to do um, and less acceptable on the world stage. Um, but that's just my, my soapbox. I have one more question for Caitlin, and then I'll open it up to the Q&A. But Caitlin, I, just, I, I think it's important, again, I, to share your perspective. You came home from captivity. What is the experience like, and what can we do better as the U.S. government to support, or as the American public to support you when you come home? Um, so coming home from a hostage situation is hard. It's, it is so much harder to reintegrate, for families to reintegrate, to support someone who's returned from that situation than I think most people realize. Um, and it, in my view, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done around supporting and having a plan in place to support people who are returning either from a hostage taking or a wrongful detainment because they're, they're essentially two sides of the same coin. If I were taken hostage today by the Haqqani, it would be a wrongful detainment because now they're considered uh, leadership of a country, whereas they were a foreign terrorist organization at the time we were taken hostage. But the same conditions would apply, the same trauma, the same mistreatment, regardless. Um, and someone coming back from that, it was very hard because you come, you come out of that sort of situation, um, you know, in my case, I'm 
I'm fortunate in that I was very resilient, that I had some very supportive family. However, even so, I didn't recognize a lot of my own passivity. I wasn't able to, to really on my own figure out financial support for myself and my children, figure out um, like medical insurance, things like that. Um, and there wasn't a lot of support in place for that or even to get an easy referral to experienced trauma therapists that might be equipped to deal with these sorts of situations. Um, another side of it that most people don't realize is that it's not intuitive, the reunification with your family, you, especially if someone is held for a long time, then um, they have one image of what returning is going to look like and their family has a different one because they've been completely isolated from each other and so there's a lot of struggle and sometimes it doesn't look the way that you expect it to and again there's no resources in place at this time to help with that reunification in any sort of fulsome way. So I gave you plenty of warning so hopefully you have some questions. <laughs> We'll start with, of course, Peter Bergen. Um, you know, I have, um, I'm not gonna put Roger on the spot here, uh, because, but I'll ask Chris maybe for his view. I mean, it's very easy to kind of uh, come up with a wrongful detention uh, sort of assignment when it's Iran or Russia or China. But what, if, what about when it's Saudi? I mean, there are Americans who are being held in Saudi indefinitely, they fit the wrongful detention, but you know they're sort of an ally of the United States. So that's one question. The other question I have, and it's related, is about exit bans. So a lot of countries, including countries like Saudi Arabia, are they're not putting people in prison, but they're saying you can't leave the country, and and you know, and that's sort of a permanent. I, and that maybe they, that is a question for you, Roger, because I know that you're considering what to do about that. And then sort of finally. There's obviously a moral hazard question uh, that, you know, as a, would economists would say, which is every time you make a deal, you know, is Putin sort of restocking the cupboard, as it were, with other Americans? Sorry to ask three questions. Um, All right, let's start with Roger. <laughs> the last one, I'll take the last one first. By the way, love the socks. They're, they're, they're skull and bones, pirate-like type socks. They're just fantastic. Um, it was good. So, um, the the moral hazard question. Uh, I would say common sense is that if we make a deal with the Russians, they're going to take more people. And if another country sees us make a deal with the Russians, they're going to take more people. But the math just doesn't add up. My numbers are going down. There was a time when I had 54 cases on my desk. We of course got more, but we kept getting people back. And so right now I'm uh, in the mid 20s, and so we're not seeing the restocking of the pond. Now. You know, I'm crossing my fingers and hope it doesn't happen. It might, very well might, because again, it seems like it should be happening, but it, it's not. And I think on the moral hazard question, uh, to, I think to my mind, uh, it, there's also a moral imperative. You know, your citizens, blue passport holders, they were uh, journalists in an NGO. They just had the spirit of wanting to travel and they get grabbed. You know, your country kind of owes you uh, the response. It's our responsibility to bring that person back. And so we have to wrestle with that. But to my mind, there's a moral imperative and that times that outweighs the moral hazard. Um, I totally forgot the other two questions. <laughs> Exit bans. So we are working on that. Now, you know, to my mind, uh, and I'll tell you, I, I personally think that is, uh, that qualifies as a wrongful detention. But we're also wrestling as, as a building at the State Department to try to come up with, uh, you know, what the building thinks. And we've had some very spirited conversations. There's a healthy tension when we talk about this. And so I think we're, we're, we're going to come up to the right solution. It's taken a little while, but we, we still struggle with this. I'm just going to add yeah. why the time for deterrence is right now, because we need, now that we've cleared the slates yeah. and you've done such a great job of it, we need to stop both Americans from going to these places and from these countries from taking yeah. people. Anything to add? No, Roger did a great job of letting <laughs> that out. We had your third question that we didn't get to. Well, you know, So maybe I can offer this, that I know we're getting ready to wrap up, but the bottom line is I think consular affairs, I can say this, I'm outside of State Department, they need to take a harder view on these, or a harder approach. I think that they need to replicate, and that was put out in bringing home hostages uh, in the, uh, the yearly Foley report we talked about. 
ensuring that consular affairs could replicate some of the tools that the rest of the U.S. government uses insofar as focus on hostages. So I think there's some lessons to be learned, but I would take a hard approach. I would like to see a harder approach to the countries that are holding people that are citizens in different circumstances. Um, I think we should take a harder view. And I think comprehensive deterrence can then be a carrot and a stick if we do it right. That's right. I know you had a question. How much time do we have, Peter? <laughs> okay. Hey, Patty Morrissey, I'm hogging the questions today. Hi, Roger. Um, um, I wanted to address, um, it sounds like you've made incredible progress on these individual cases, and I can't even imagine what goes on behind the scenes. What I'm thinking about after uh, meeting a woman last week in Prague who runs an NGO who tries to get kidnapped Ukrainian children out of Russia, um, is the idea of mass hostage taking as a weapon of war, as we saw on October 7th, as we've seen uh, with Russia and, and Ukrainians in the uh, east of the country. How much crossover with your portfolio, where you're focusing on getting Americans back, how much of this hostage taking as a weapon of war are you guys able to tackle, or is that going to require additional resources to address? It would probably require additional authorities um, right now, we're pretty much target focused on getting Americans who've been wrongfully detained or, or uh, uh, green card holders, LPRs. Um, having said that, we've uh, Secretary Blinken has asked us, you know, if it, there's a way to help our, our allies and partners get people back, then then push on. So we've been able to work on the on the margins to try to bring other people back. Uh, we've had conversations in these mass cases. Of course, we're deeply involved in what's going on uh, in Gaza. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, issues crossed my desk on a few occasions, but I think that would require a change in authorities. Uh, I, I guess the bottom line is uh, we, we probably are still going to grow. I th it wouldn't shock me if five years from now we'd see other things added on to my table in terms of what we need to get done. We're not quite there yet, and so what we do is just try to do the right thing at the right place at the right time. And if it's not us, we're going to find the people that they should be talking to because these things need to be addressed. So sometimes I'll throw it to my colleagues in, in DRL, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. But um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch the evolution of this office over time. Uh, Roy Gutman from the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Um, I just uh, wonder if you could talk about Gaza a little bit more. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a strong view among the Israeli public <coughs> that uh, uh, Bibi has not done enough, that he's almost holding the country hostage to his own political fortunes. <coughs> is the U.S. putting, uh, and, the, and the U.S. government has put a lot of pressure on, we know, uh, sending top officials and keeping them <laughs> in the region for a very long time. But uh, is the U.S. pushing uh, Bibi Netanyahu sufficiently, do you think? I think I'm going to put that to Chris. Well, I can't really yeah. speak to that with any authority. I uh, <coughs> intend on going to Israel uh, for the October 7th anniversary to participate in discussions on counterterrorism, so I'll have a better sense for it. But that's mostly an internal political dynamic right now happening in Israel in terms of uh, internal politics with Netanyahu and his government. And the bottom line is I can just offer this. Five days after October 7th, I, had a, I did an interview in Politico and I said, you know, at the end of the day, there is going to be the politicization on one side or the other of hostage issues. And uh, I'm not going to take a side, but I would just offer that that's a dynamic that is factored into the Gaza equation. In other words, politics are going to play out in, in hostage matters. Um, there, I, there are different perspectives on both sides of the, the political spectrum. And I'll just end with this, that my father did die in captivity. We just saw her school group Poland die in captivity. Every day matters, so there needs to be a sense of urgency that right. we need to take action now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to my friends. <laughs>